Good evening, everyone. Sego ani buju endio wachea kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So with that as an uh, official call to order, Madam Deputy Clerk, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mayor Patterson, we have quorum. Okay, thank you. So we were meeting in committee of the whole closed meeting. We discussed uh, several items, including a code of conduct complaint from 2021. Uh, we discussed various Ontario land tribunal appeals. Uh, and then we also discussed the Ontario land tribunal appeal for the former Davis Tannery. So I will ask for a motion to rise without reporting, please. Moved by Councillor Boehm, seconded by Councillor Chinani, that council rise from committee of the whole closed meeting without reporting. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, next we'll move to the approval of the adeds. Uh, we have uh, an additional delegation, an additional new motions, a new motion, and a number of communications. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the adeds, please? Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Shaves. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Councillor Glenn. I, Connie Glenn, of the Committee of the Whole, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Report 23027. For the following reason, my business has conducted business with one of the subjects of the report and subsequent recommendation. Okay, thank you. Are there any other declarations? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. We have no presentations this evening, but we do have one delegation. Uh, at this point, I will invite Joseph Dowser to appear before council to speak to Clause 1D of Report Number 9, received from the Nominations Advisory Committee with respect to public appointments to boards, committees, and commissions. Mr. Dowser, you can make your way to the podium. Uh, and just a reminder that you have up to five minutes to speak, and then I will open up the floor to questions from council. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you with respect to an important matter. As you may be aware, the Kingston Area Taxi Commission is responsible for the licensing, regulation, enforcement, and governance of the taxi industry operating in the city of Kingston and Loyalist Township. I wish to also bring to your attention that the jurisdiction of the KATC was granted by provincial legislation in 1989 by way of statute entitled An Act Representing the City of Kingston and the Townships of Kingston Pittsburgh and Ernesttown under PR 24 and PR 97. Over the past year, the KATC has made tremendous strides and has been very active in driving positive and transformative modernization of how we operate and support the industry, the public, and vulnerable persons. We recognize that there is a clear path and have achieved a good governance model to our established strategic plan. However, this good governance model could potentially be destabilized and as such, we are duty bound to bring to light concerns raised. We of course understand that through no fault of the nominations committee, considering the numerous applications received for various committees, an individual has been nominated that presents a clear conflict of interest as prescribed in the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act and the Municipal Code of Conduct. In the interest of protecting the nominee's privacy, I would ask that council refer to the confidential legal document that was forwarded to each of you in advance to this meeting. This document, as provided by our legal counsel, advises that the nominee would be in persistent conflict of interest under the Act and or Code of Conduct and would subsequently be required to declare a conflict of interest. It is difficult to imagine an issue arising before the KATC that the nominee would not have to declare a conflict of interest under the Act and or the Code of Conduct. Ultimately, the nominee would be limited to their involvement and effectiveness as a member of the KATC and therefore it is not recommended that the nominee be appointed. We, the KATC, submit to this council that based upon legal interpretation, our request to remove this nominee from the list of recommendations and subsequently refer the matter, in this case the vacancy, 
to the nominations committee with recommendations that another public member be selected. The KATC would respectfully be happy to assist the nominations committee in its efforts to support the selection of public members that would not be in conflict of interest from the remaining applicants, much like KEDCO. The KATC is its, and its members remain vil, vil, sorry. The KATC and its members remain vi, vigilant in our responsibilities and duties. Should council appoint the nominee in question, the KATC would be placed in a vicarious position to render a ruling in conjunction with the legal interpretation and enact Section 3.05 of the KATC's bylaw number one. We hope that council appreciates the difficulty and the sensitive nature of this issue and understands the position the KATC holds with respect to this matter. On behalf of the Kingston Area Taxi Commission, we thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, uh, thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Okay, I see none. Mr. Dowser, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and with that, we will continue in our agenda. We have no further delegations. We have no briefings. Are there any petitions to present? Okay, seeing none, uh, we have no motions of congratulations uh, or recognition or condolence. Uh, however, uh, I do see that uh, here tonight that our fire chief, uh, Sean Armstrong, is here. Uh, this is the fire chief's last working day, I understand. And so, chief, uh, on behalf of all of council, I want to thank you for your leadership uh, at Kingston Fire and Rescue, I think you've been a fantastic fire chief and done an absolutely outstanding job, and we wish you the very best in your retirement. Thank you, Your Worship. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I'll sit down. Thank you very much, and uh, I'd just like to say thank you, Your Worship. It's been a pleasure working with you and having the support of council over the last seven years. And I wish this new term of council the very best over the next four years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief. All the best. Okay. Okay, uh, we have no deferred motions this evening, so we will move on to reports. First up, we have report number six from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that report number six from the Chief Administrative Officer, consent be received and adopted. Okay, so there are five clauses in the uh, consent report. Would anyone like any of those clauses separated? Okay, seeing none, then we will vote on them as a whole. So clause one is renewal of the service level agreement between the City of Kingston and the Kingston Area Association of Museums, Art Galleries, and Historic Sites. Clause two, renewal of the service level agreement between the City of Kingston and the Kingston Indigenous Languages Nest. Clause three, unopened road allowance access agreements. Clause four, extension of lease with keys in support of social enterprises and building sustainability in the food ecosystem at ports with Olympic Harbor. And clause five, repeal and replace bylaw number 98-8 as amended being a bylaw to appoint statutory officials of the corporation of the City of Kingston. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on to report number seven from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Ridge, seconded by Councillor Shaves, that report number seven from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, so just uh, just before we get moving, uh, Councillor Amos, I, yes, I do see your hand. Uh, I'll, um, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Your Honor, and through you. So uh, you have a, a declaration to, to make, is that right, Councillor Ames? I do, sorry. I'm okay, go, go ahead. Dealing with my computer here. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, Don Amos, Councillor of the City of Kingston, hereby declare an indirect pecuniary interest with respect to report number seven, clause one, 2023, annual amendment to fees and changes bylaw 2005-10, because I'm a member of a body, uh, the Seniors Association Kingston Region, which rents space from the Kingston East Community Centre. Thank you, Your Honour. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Councillor Amos. So we will deal with Clause 1 right now, so you can um, uh, just uh, uh, excuse yourself from the meeting. So Clause 1 is 2023 Annual Amendment to Fees and Charges Bylaw 2005-10. 
Any discussion? Councillor Stephen. Okay, to ask a question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, on page 210 of the schedule, there is a fee about tree permit removal and cutting, and I just didn't fully understand. I was hoping someone from staff might be able to explain what that means, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Park. Uh, thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Um, the tree uh, removal fee uh, applies to properties uh, that are removing uh, trees in order to facilitate development on um, the property. Now, this does not apply to residential lots uh, that are part of a plan of subdivision or a condominium. However, for all other lots in the city, it does apply. And what you have here is you have three categories of uh, fees. Uh, they're in a range, I believe it's one to five trees. Uh, then, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just about six to 15 trees and then more than uh, 15 trees. What this permit is, is it, they have to submit the permit before any trees are removed. Um, and they have to identify the trees that are being removed and provide a reason as to why they're being removed as long as as well as with an arborist report. That is reviewed by our forestry uh, division and they will make the decision and make the recommendation whether the uh, permit should be issued to me. So that aspect is just the, the application to remove the trees. For each tree that is removed, they have to replace it. And that can be done one of two ways. They either have to plant a new tree on site and if that's not possible, then they have to pay a fee to replace that tree. I'm hoping that answers your question. If there's anything else I can respond to, I'd through be happy you, to. Through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or discussion? Councillor Ridge. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, this is just a general question about the percentage of increase in terms of, of fees. Um, as per the report, uh, the usual formula is the third quarter uh, consumer price index plus 1% uh, for capital budgets. And in the recommendations, it is a 3% increase. Uh, the third quarter CPI, it was 4.7, so that 4.7 plus 1 is 5.7% increase. Uh, would staff be able to give a bit more of an explanation with regards to the difference? Ms. Kennedy. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ridge. Um, so yes, the, the calculation does come out based on the formula at 5.7%. At um, and that percentage or that calculation we use as a general proxy when we start to look at how we're increasing the fees. Um, but more importantly then, we also then look at what the actual costs are for the fees to ensure that we're recovering them appropriately. Um, so if we, and the other piece of it that we do look at is we want to make sure that we keep a similar proportion of fee to tax subsidy. So uh, knowing we have at this point a 1.3% increase in our operating budget plus 1% for capital, we also want to stay sort of within that same realm. So it is looking at how we're going to manage that inflation, um, hopefully some lower costs, and then analyzing that cost according to, uh, to the revenue. And so that's why you'll see in the report a number of categories, because inflation was so high, but you'll see a number of categories where we've made an adjustment that's other than the average of about 2%, which is what we would normally use in terms of just a, a standard increase. Thank you very much for the explanation. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Okay, we will call the vote on Clause 1. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause 2, updates and implementation planning for National Wall of Remembrance Project. We will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause 3, operational planning model for response time improvements. Councillor Shapes. Um, this has been a concern of mine throughout my campaign in regards to emergency services within Kingston, especially within my district. So this is one that's kind of close to me. And uh, if I may ask several questions to confirm, when was the last time we hired additional firefighters? 
The chief. Through your worship, I'm sorry I didn't hear the question completely. Uh, yes, um, Councillor Shaves, if you can just uh, speak up a little bit just so that um, the chief can hear your question. The first question was uh, the last time that we hired additional uh, firefighters. career firefighters. Yes. I don't have the exact date, your worship, uh, through you, uh, but I do know it's uh, well predates uh, before my time and uh, potentially it was back around uh, uh, when Station 7 was expanded in uh, a couple of decades ago. 2003, I believe it is. And the same thing with the fire hall. Last one was in 2003. That's correct. I believe it. that was 2003 also, Your Worship. We did add a... Uh, an additional building recently, a net zero carbon building, which was uh, during the last seven years. Not specifically for fire responses, but to manage and maintain the fleet at the uh, training center. And considering that last time, the population growth in the West End has grown 33% according to the report on file? That's correct, Your Worship. So currently right now we're playing catch up in regards to response times and fire staff? That's correct, and if I can clarify. We uh, embarked in, uh, in 2020 on an accreditation process which allowed us to look at uh, a plan to mitigate the uh, lagging response times, especially in areas where there was significant growth. And we looked at the west side and the east side as areas that, that may be uh, uh, lagging in response times, to, to say the least. We did uh, determine that uh, there were gaps in services to council's approved benchmarks which are outlined in the bylaw for fire services. And uh, this report was a plan to mitigate those uh, gaps. It's not just uh, staffing in isolation, but uh, it's part of uh, optimizing response capacities through uh, boundary adjustments, and also looking at uh, uh, the third crossing in, the, in a year, in the Wabang crossing, to see the impact that that will have on the uh, responses to the east side from the central. And, uh, and also uh, recommending that a new location be built on the west side of Kingston. The area is yet to be determined. Could you please state what those benchmarks are and what the average response time is in the west end? Through you, Your Worship. The uh, benchmark for urban responses, and uh, if I can categorize uh, responses between rural and urban, Urban uh, making up 90% of the, of the responses uh, comprised of 10% of the coverage area of 450 square kilometers, so 45 square kilometers would be urban in nature. On the west side, the benchmark is 6 minutes and 50 seconds, and currently for west uh, urban responses, we're at 8 minutes and 50 seconds, and that was uh, over two years, uh, representing 1,949 calls or about 971 and 978 calls, respectively. I see some other councillors want to ask some questions. I'll defer. Okay. Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, based on your estimation, how many of your current crew is set for retirement in the next five to 10 years? Uh, your Worship, through you, I don't have those numbers. Uh, we generally recruit about uh, between two and five a year uh, based on retirements. Other questions? Uh, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, approximately how many firefighters does it take to uh, staff a full truck across the, the numerous different shifts? Our, uh, through your worship, our, our goal is to staff a pumper with four firefighters. And uh, to do that, uh, we, we generally uh, hire five. And that accommodates for absences such as vacation, uh, approved leaves, and unplanned absences such as sick leave. Uh, generally uh, speaking, uh, in a 24-hour period, we have one firefighter off all the time throughout the whole year of 365 days. Okay, thank you. Um, additionally, would there be firefighters that would be off uh, due to like workplace injury or anything else that would be, I guess, filled in by the, that, that fifth member as well? 
We do, uh, like all uh, municipal services, have uh, persons that are off on workplace safety and insurance uh, injuries, and uh, we work uh, collaboratively with our occupational health to help them bring them back to uh, work-ready capacity. Okay, thank you. Councillor Amos. Thank you, Your Honour, through you. Uh, this is to the fire chief. Um, in the proposed plan that is laid out over the next five years, uh, is it in your estimate that that, that uh, with the new build, a potential new build, I guess this, uh, you, you indicated the site hasn't been picked yet, um, but with the new build, will our response times come down and does the current plan um, meet with your satisfaction? Through your worship, uh, yes, the plan meets with uh, my satisfaction. The opportunity to add staff and improve response times is part of a recent initiative with respect to our accreditation status, our continuous quality improvement. And the idea is also adding staffing, but also optimizing our response capacity within the existing coverage areas by boundary adjustments and the additional staff on the West End. We want to be uh, operationally ready to go when uh, the new location is uh, uh, built. And so this incremental plan uh, looks at that in a thoughtful way with respect to, uh, you know, a planned uh, process to train firefighters to have them ready so that when the fire station is built, uh, they can hit the road running, so to speak. A follow up, Your Honor. Uh, yes, you um, you have four minutes and 30 seconds on the clock. Oh, well, now that I've got that much time. Um. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to use all that time, Councillor Amos, but you have that time if you need it. I understand, I understand sir. Thank you. Um, difficult question, Chief. Um, is the city at risk right now in its western side coverage? Through your worship, uh, the city is currently uh, not meeting the uh, initial uh, travel time for first arriving apparatus. Uh, when all arriving apparatus arrive at the scene, we do meet the travel time. We are uh, annually assessing this uh, gap and we are taking actions to improve the benchmark, which is uh, which the councillor prior asked uh, of six minutes and 50 seconds. That includes uh, the call processing time, the time it takes for a firefighter to dress and get on a vehicle, and then the travel time to the scene. So this focus uh, that was referenced in the report was really respect, with respect to travel time for first arriving apparatus. Now we understand if we can improve the first arriving apparatus in those areas that have gaps that will bring the, all of the coverage area uh, into a better uh, realm for council's uh, performance benchmark. And that's what we're striving to do. We're trying to balance out the coverage areas and uh, bring the benchmark response time or closer to the baseline or vice versa, bring the baseline responses closer to the council's approved targets. So like any service, we're uh, looking at how we can improve. And uh, the plan is a plan that will be reviewed annually. And I should clarify for council, this plan would go forward. Uh, as endorsed as part of the 2024 operating budget considerations and uh, then these issues will be uh, addressed again uh, if endorsed by council and the opportunity to uh, uh, have input from the fire chief based on more experience with the Waband crossing opening, more experience with data related to the boundary adjustments and then uh, uh, decisions uh, on, the, on the staffing can uh, be done in, with data in mind. Thank you, Chief, and good luck in retirement. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Hassan. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, through you. Um, question to the Chief. What is the current uh, status of our staff in our force here in Kingston? And what is the gap between the current staff and needed staff to improve our uh, call time to provide the best service to the King Kingstonian? The incremental plan uh, through your worship uh, prepares uh, staff to be ready and operational upon completion of the of the uh, fire station and uh, we will uh, look at that plan over four years 
and uh, address the issues around uh, response time optimization through boundary adjustments and also the impacts of the third crossing. And we'll have better data, improved data to report in terms of that experience uh, in time for the budget considerations and deliberations in 2024. Would you uh, like to share some of the challenges the department going through to having sufficient number for the firefighters to meet the requirement or meet the need of Kingston? Well, I can tell you anecdotally uh, through you, Your Worship, that uh, the calls are more complex. Uh, the firefighters uh, have uh, risen to the occasion in very difficult times over the last three years, and their, their efforts have been uh, stellar. And this, this adds uh, complexity and uh, difficulty to each call they go to. And they're not always uh, just about putting out fires. There's a, a lot of uh, community-driven efforts that are undertaken by firefighters each and every day to ensure that the community is safe. These are some of the challenges that don't always get reported in the data. However, they add complexity and uh, time at a call, or average time at a scene for all of the calls is around 30 minutes where they're addressing, uh, and that includes the very most minor call to the most, most major call. And, uh, and then there are the big calls that take uh, all night. But the complexity of the calls in the last seven years have uh, definitely been on the increase. As you uh, retiring from the service after many years to serve the Kingston, which we all appreciate it, uh, would you mind to share some of the plan who is taking over and are you leaving the force ready to take over and follow the steps you have been taken to provide the good service and the protection to the citizens? Commissioner Joyce. Thank you and through you, Your Worship. Um, so I best answer that. So we are in a recruitment stage for a new fire chief. Uh, that will probably go on for a few weeks yet. It's been in the stages now and uh, for a couple months. Um, I can't clone him, unfortunately. I'd like to, um, but I'm unable to do that. Uh, and he doesn't have a twin, so it does mean we're looking out and everywhere uh, for our next fire chief. In the interim, and you'll see uh, you uh, already passed it under the statutory officials, um, I, I'll be the interim fire chief uh, by name only um, in the interim until we hire a permanent fire chief. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If there are no other questions, Councillor uh, Councillor Shapes, you've already spoken, um, so I I'm sorry, but I'll go to anybody else that hasn't spoken to this particular file. Okay, so we will call the vote then on point of order. Point of order. I want to refer with direction, please. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I would like to refer this report with direction. So, Councillor Shaves, so because you already spoke, um, you, it can't come back to you on this particular item. So once I move on to another councillor, you cannot speak more than once to a clause that comes up on a, in a council meeting mm, as per a procedural bylaw. Sorry, I wasn't aware because I gave up my time to defer because I saw other councillors who wanted to speak. So I wanted to defer that before referring this. So, um, what I would suggest is you've made that. If another councillor that has not spoken wants to, to take that action, then they are welcome to do that. But unfortunately, to be fair, uh, that option is not open to you. Okay. So, I'm afraid I'll have to go ahead and call the vote on Clause 3. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed, and that carries by a vote of 12 to 1. Councillor Shaves opposed. Okay, moving on to Clause 4, 2023-2026 Strategic Plan Process. Councillor McLaren. Thank you. So um, I had some concerns uh, the last time that we did strategic planning, and I'm hoping that some of them might be addressed in this time. So I noticed in the report there was a lot less... Um, Less, less detail about what's going to be happening than there was in, in uh, four years ago. So I'm wondering, when we hire the facilitator, uh, one of the concerns that I had last time was that a lot of the concerns that I had heard at the door 
were not able to be put into the strategic plan. And one of the way, there was at least two techniques that were used uh, to limit them. So we were only allowed three top issues. Uh, then we had a dotmocracy, and we also had breakout groups in which we shrunk that pool of, of um, items that were brought up. I'm wondering if we can have a guarantee that um, those kind of techniques will not be used in the new strategic planning process this time around. CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the last uh, report that uh, came to you was about four years ago. You're correct. And it, it came actually with a proposal already in place uh, from a facilitator. Um, and that proposal included all those different steps. So we haven't yet um, obviously went out to, uh, to retain a, a facilitator, and that's something we would do following the council direction. And we can make sure that we ask for different approaches. Um, the other piece, too, that we've included in this process is the public engagement component that I think wasn't part of the initial um, proposal that you had four years ago. So that's something that we've included this time. But one of the things that I, I can definitely do is bring back the proposals to, um, to council in terms of decision making. So you actually see the facilitator's proposal and you can select from those facilitators. Great. And in the event that um, we like one but not everything about it, would it be possible to adjust part of that before we decide? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So absolutely, um, there will be flexibility to work with the facilitator and adjust, make adjustments to the, the potential plan that they're going to be submitting. Great. Thank you. And um, the second concern is um, with regards to the metrics that we're going to be using. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, this time as a point of, pro of uh, continuous improvement that a few more numbers can be added on compared to last time and in particular the, um, the councillor wish list be considered the metrics of success of a strategic plan um, as the outcomes that we hope to see at least done in four years. Is that also a possibility? Thank you and through you Ms. Mayor. So the um, there will be some possibility to better define uh, what council would like to see as far as metrics, and that's going to be part of the process with the facilitator. There's also going to be an implementation plan that will be brought back to city council because we understand that the priorities are probably going to be, for the most part, at a higher level. Um, so in order to implement those priorities from a staff perspective, we will need to bring back a number of different action or initiatives that can be implemented over the course of four years uh, from staff perspective, and those will also include measurables and metrics. Great. And uh, my final point is regarding, I guess, counselor and staff training with regards to the concepts behind strategic planning and how it differs, say, from work plans, how strategy differs from tactics, how ways and means differ from outcomes, and how strategic planning is well, how, what the roles of council and staff are, such that um, we don't step on each other's toes on that. Will any of that kind of training um, on those concepts and the theory behind strategic planning uh, be provided for council? Through Mr. Mayor, so we can ask the facilitator to ensure that there is that information that's provided to council and at the beginning of the process. So there's a, a better idea or, or we have well-defined roles and responsibilities. And we understand that the strategic planning process and the priorities are council's priorities. So the facilitator, I think, can play a role at the beginning of that process. Um, and staff, of course, will be available to provide any information or respond to any question that you might have during that process. Great. That sounds wonderful. Do you need a motion for that or just trust you to do it right? Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anybody else? Uh, Councillor Glenn. Well, Councillor McLaren asked most of the questions I was uh, thinking about asking, but to echo um, sort of what he's been driving at, uh, the success of a, a strat plan really depends on understanding what the process is. So I'm really going to emphasize that I think a little preparatory education for both staff and council are necessary to ensure the success of it. Uh, also, without appropriate outcome measures, 
then we don't know how successful we are at progressing through it. So um, th those are very clear in our process and in the implementation plan. So that's just my general comments on it. Thank you, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, one question I have perhaps for our treasurer is if we would have an idea of the impact of Bill 23 on our overall budgeting process before we get into strategic planning, because it's, if we want to measure outcomes, we have to know what we're dealing with in our financial resources to do so. So I'm curious if we have any insight onto that yet. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. So we have provided a, a previous report to Council on what we knew to date, um, but we're continuing to gather more information and the province continues to send different things out to us. So yes, absolutely, we'll continue to update Council on that uh, and make sure that you've got the most current information that we've got. Okay, is there anybody else? Councillor Hassan. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> It's just a kind of a suggestion um, and a request that I would like to consult to get an EDI 101 uh, before the strategic planning process as a committee of the whole for us to benefit and learn from the subject matter um, expert at the city. We must have a better understanding of the matter before we decided on the council's strategic priorities. I see your hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So I recognize that, unfortunately, I don't think we did identify that in the report. I believe it's planned for February, but I can be corrected by my colleagues if, if I don't have this uh, correctly. So that is before our strategic planning. Mm -hmm. Councillor Sun. Okay. If there's no other discussion, we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, clause 5, initiation of Brownfield tax increment rebate payments for 652 Princess Street. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on to report number 8 from Planning Committee. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that report number 8 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Okay, there's the one clause, approval of application for community improvement plan amendments, Brownfields Community Improvement Plan. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. To report number nine from the Nominations Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that report number nine from the Nominations Advisory Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so um, my general practice is to read through all the names once everybody has spoken to the report. So first we will open up for any discussion. Uh, Councilor McLaren. Thank you. Based on some new information and having consulted with the city solicitor and the clerk, um, I have an amendment to defer back two committees to uh, the nominations committee for further recruitment. And if the clerk could put it up. That would oh, be great. Okay, thank you, Councilor McLaren. So we have a motion to amend. Uh, moved by Councilor McLaren, seconded by Councilor Tozo. The report 9, Clause 1H, with respect to appointments to the Committee of Adjustment, and Clause 1D, with respect to appointments to the Taxi Commission, be deferred and referred back to the Nominations Committee to allow staff to conduct additional recruitment. Any discussion? Okay, we'll call the vote then on the motion to amend. All those in favor? Opposed, uh, and that's carried. Okay, so we are now in report number nine as amended. Is there any other discussion? Okay, so. Okay. So, we have public appointments to boards, committees, and commissions. Uh, so, that Gail McAllister be appointed to the Kingston Police Services Board for a term ending November 30th, 2024. The Arts Advisory Committee, Alina Baker and Matthew Campbell, again for a term ending November 30th, 2024. The Appeals Committee, Tara Kaner, Robert Knox, and Todd Storms for a term ending November 30th, 2023. The Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee, Jane Bailey, Kathy Borowick, Ian Clark, River Hill, and Hanny Phillip, 
her term ending November 30th, 2024. Uh, and that we would also uh, have an alternate pool uh, of Annette Burfoot, Oren Nemelman, and Zachary Typher. Kingston and Frontenac Housing Corporation Board, Brian Hamburg, Sanjeev Kapoor, Constantine Muganga, Lisa Oliveira, and Sharon Shear. And again, those are terms for either November, until November 30th, 2023, or November 30th, 2024, uh, with also additional applicants, Denise Cumming and Amalur Aluku added to the alternate pool. North Kingstown Secondary Plan Community Working Group, Mary Farrar, Roger Healy, Ann Laheed, Richard Moulton, Jamie Swift, and Greg Tilson uh, for a term ending November 31st, December 31st, 2023. Kingston Frontenac Public Library Board, Mark Asberg, Ann Brunner, Alicia Capello, Elizabeth Goodyear Grant, Kathleen Hamilton, Jim Neal, and Jennifer Ross for a term ending November 14th, 2026 with Jane Kingsland, Mary Beth Gauthier, Denise Cumming, Marcus Letourneau, Dorothy Ann Brown, Jillian Brown, and Caroline Bedard added in the alternate pool. Kingston Environmental Advisory Forum, Lidmula Aguilera, Rachel Askett, Jessica Campbell, Diane Corrigan, Josh Cowan, Riza Jamshidi Chinari, David Stocks, and Jaka Siriani for a term ending November 14th, 2026, with Alan White, Mark Sibley, and Bob Young added to the alternate pool. Planning Advisory Committee, Kimberly Fawcett-Smith, Ibrahim Katena, Sam Davies, Kelly Stevenson, Donna Gillespie, Tony Goetzis, Paul Martin, and Aaron St. Pierre for term ending November 14th, 2026. The Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee, Omolara Aluku, Kirsten Bland, Sunita Gupta, Abraham Kiriakos, Danielle Lucier, Natalia Martinelli, Ashley McCartney, V. Ophelia Rigaud, and Mariah Verk for a term ending either November 30th, 2023 or November 30th, 2024, with Elliot Chappell, Sarah Corbett, Regine Dagra, Daphne Mayer, Akshaya Arun, and Vanig Garabidian added to the alternate pool. Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee, Kim Atwood, Emily Bennett, Caitlin Bruce, Chantal Businski, Amy Birch, Dina Cotter, Andrea Fitzgerald, Abraham Katane, Darcy King McKay, Penny Bennett, Susan Mockler, Lucy Musu, Aldu Ramirez, Nicholas Togesi, and Janice Wilby for a term ending November 30th, 2023 or November 30th, 2024, with Dorothy Ann Brown, Donna Gannon, and Elliot Chappell added to the alternate pool. Uh, and then Clause 2, um, Affirmation of Technical Representative Appointments to the Arts Advisor Advisory Committee, Christiane Wojcik, for a term ending November 30th, 2024. Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee, Jackie Collier and Tara Everett, for a term ending November 30th, 2024. Kingston Environmental Advisory Forum, Michael Dakin, Emily Sue and Kristen Wozniak, uh, for a term ending November 14th, 2026. North Kingstown Secondary Plan Community Working Group, Wendy Bellamy, Michael Dakin, Donna Gillespie, and Army Krasnozen for a term ending November, or December 31st, 2023. And then Clause 3, Rural Advisory Committee appointments uh, to defer to uh, the Nominations Committee meeting taking place in Q1 2023. So we will call the vote on all three clauses from the Nominations Advisory Committee report. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Okay, on to report number 10 from the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that report number 10 from the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee be received and adopted. So there's the one clause, approval of City of Kingston specific recommendations based on the National Council of Canadian Muslims recommendations. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Information reports, if you have a question, just raise your hand as I read through them. Number one, October 22, 2022, contract awards subject to delegation of authority. Number two, delegated approval of signing authority for community services. 
We have no information reports from members of council. Uh, miscellaneous business. Number one, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Hassan, uh, that the following members of council be appointed to serve as deputy mayor in two-month increments as follows. December 2022 and January 2023, Councillor Bohm. February and March 2023, Councillor Chinani. April and May 2023, Councillor Amos. June and July 2023, Councillor McLaren. August and September 2023, Councillor Osterhoff. October and November 2023, Councillor Toso. And December 2023 and January 2024, Councillor Glenn. Number two, moved by Councillor Shaves, seconded by Councillor Amos, that Leslie Casson be affirmed as the Education Sector Representative for the Arts Advisory Committee, appointed for a term expiring November 30th, 2024. Moved by number three, moved by Councillor Osterhoff, seconded by Councillor Shaves, that Beth Sills be affirmed as the St. Lawrence College Representative for the Kingston Environmental Advisory Forum for a term ending November 14th, 2026. Number four, moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that Sarah Ryder, a writing be affirmed as the KFLNA Public Health Representative for the Kingston Environmental Advisory Forum for a term ending November 14th, 2026. We will call the vote on all miscellaneous motions uh, at once. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to new motions. We have six new motions on our agenda tonight. New motion number one. Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Mayor Patterson. Whereas pollinator gardens are important to our food system, whereas food systems and ecology are tied together and can be demonstrated in pollinator gardens, whereas some municipalities allow the implementation of pollinator gardens on private properties through clear guidelines such as the North American Butterfly Association program, and whereas the City of Kingston has declared a climate emergency, therefore be resolved the Council direct staff to amend bylaw 2007-136, a bylaw to provide for maintaining land in a clean and clear condition and bylaw 2005-100, a bylaw for prescribing standards for the maintenance and occupancy of property to specifically allow the implementation of pollinator gardens on private properties. And the council directs staff to develop a rollout uh, a public education campaign prior to spring 2023. Councillor Bohm, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. So this came about because uh, numerous people have uh, essentially contacted me and I'm sure other councillors as well where bylaw would pay them a visit and what they had was a pollinator garden. And part of the thing is, is it may not expressly be prohibited within some of our bylaws, but it's also not completely clear. So what this does is, is essentially provide some clarity and some framework around that with the uh, North American Butterfly Association already having prescriptions as to what a pollinator co garden constitutes. So essentially what this is trying to do is just to clarify that. So, you know, obviously pollinators are important, not just to nature, but to us as well in our food supply. And so I think the motion essentially speaks for itself. And I don't think this is going to be one of those contentious ones that comes before this council. So in the interest of uh, me standing between everybody here and probably their uh, holidays, uh, I'm going to end it right there and hope this passes. Uh, thank you. Any other discussion on new motion number one? Okay, we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, uh, new motion number two. Uh, so, Councillor Bohm, now that you've been um, formally designated as Deputy Mayor for December, January, if you could take the chair for uh, new motion number two. I will take the chair, uh, Your Worship. So, moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Hassan. Whereas the Empire Life Insurance Company has been in operation for 100 years with its head office based in Kingston since 1963. Whereas the company is 100% Canadian owned and operated with a focus on understanding and meeting the life and health insurance, investment and retirement product needs of Canadian individuals, families and small businesses. Whereas Empire Life has played a significant role in Kingston his Kingston's history by employing thousands of people in the community and contributing to the local economy. Whereas throughout its history, Empire Life and its employees have been key contributors and supporters of many local organizations and initiatives every year, giving back to the community financially and through volunteerism. Therefore, be it resolved that Council approve an exemption to the proclamation policy and that Kingston City Council proclaim January 8 to 14, 2023, as Empire Life Centennial Celebration Week in the City of Kingston. And I recognize you if you'd like to speak to it there, Your, your Worship. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So just to clarify, so we have a proclamation policy here at the city that allows community groups, nonprofit groups, for example, to apply for proclamations to recognize significant milestones and events. That proclamation policy excludes private business. This is an exception 
asking for an exception to that, given the significance of the milestone that we are talking about. Um, this was done a number of years ago, I believe, for Novellus' 75th anniversary. This again for Empire Life's 100th anniversary. I think recognition of the significance of the milestone, the significance of a major employer uh, here in the city of Kingston and just being able to recognize uh, the great work that they do and the role that they play in the community. Empire Life uh, is very involved in United Way campaigns and many other community charitable events. And so I think that this is an appropriate recognition and would ask the council support. Thank you, Your Worship. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the motion? Seeing no one else would like to speak, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that passes unanimously, and I return the chair, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. We will move on to uh, new motion number three, moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor McLaren, where City Council considered a draft rental licensing program for properties containing one to three residential rental units, boarding, rooming, and lodging houses, and those containing four or more rental units that do not have a registered site plan control agreement in 2018. Whereas City Council deferred the consideration of the draft rental licensing program until City of Kingston completed its comprehensive zoning bylaw, which was finalized in 2022. Whereas the province of Ontario has recently removed site plan agreement requirements for residential developments with less than 10 units. And whereas there are concerns regarding the health and safety of rental units in the city that could adversely impact the well-being of Kingstonians. Therefore, be resolved that Council directs staff to review and update the 2018 draft rental licensing program to reflect provincial legislation, and that as part of this update, staff consider the potential for a phased-in program starting with the districts of Sydenham and Kings Court Rideau. And that Council directs staff to report back with an updated rental licensing program to Administrative Policies Committee by Q4 2023. Councillor Glenn, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, so this came about while I was campaigning and seeing the poor condition of housing uh, in my district, rental housing um, that was substandard. So when you're seeing the health, safety, and well-being of the citizens that you're representing being put at risk, I think that we are compelled to move to do something about this. So there were infestations, um, black mold reported. I had volunteers who were unwilling to go up some of the steps. And we don't have the mechanism to sort of um, handle this very well. So this is why this is being brought forward, is there needs to be a recognition that there's an imbalance between um, the power structure of a landlord renting to a tenant. Tenants are often afraid to come forward when the housing conditions are so poor, particularly in this time of housing crisis. Um, you know, I think a lot of the feedback I got as I started moving forward with this was, you know, there was a thought that maybe I was trying to penalize landlords in bringing this forward, and that's not at all the case. Other businesses, other professions are regulated. Good regulation protects the public. So this is about public protection. It's about protecting the well-being of the citizens. It's about a recognition that that's part of the duty and obligation that we have to them, and that other professions and other businesses um, adhere to sets of standards. When you are a landlord, you're providing a product, and that's a home for someone. And so that product should be of a standard that is acceptable to all of us. Um, so that's the heart and soul of bringing this forward, and I hope that you'll all support moving ahead with this initiative. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, yes, when Councillor Glenn uh, proposed this motion, Kings Court Rideau is one of the major areas with, a, I, I believe, a, a considerable landlord tenant imbalance of power, which I think this motion, uh, I'm curious to see what the li licensing program comes up with and how we can e equalize the balance. I find with our current lack of vacancy rates, it's given considerable power to landlords in, in, in that relationship. So I'm curious to see the implications of this that staff will come up with and what the exact licensing program will look like. So I, I will vote in favor of this motion with the knowledge that we have to sort of see what it looks like when it, it staff reports back. So thank you, your worship. Uh, thank you, next is Deputy Mayor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I just want to understand some more of the concerns that were just brought up and maybe ask staff, um, do we currently lack the tools to do this or, or is it 
is there not some framework that we would have that would address some of these issues? And, and if that framework exists, um, is it potentially the fact that we lack the staff to be able to enforce the existing policies? I'm just a little bit worried that we're just sort of adding more and more rules on top of things without the actual teeth to enforce them. Okay, so I see both uh, Mr. Smith and Commissioner Agnew have put their hands up, so I'll let them fight out. Who would like to, uh, to jump in first? Uh, Commissioner Agnew. Uh, no, thank you, and through your worship, perhaps I'll start, and then uh, if uh, Mr. Smith has something to, to add to that, certainly he would be welcome. Um, to your point, Councillor Bohm, I think the issue is we do certainly have property standards bylaw, but the challenge that we have that I believe Councillor Glenn was alluding to is the fact that there is uh, such a significant number of units in the community that are potentially um, in question. What we have right now is a complaint-based process, and that speaks to some of the concern that's been presented also with respect to tenant-landlord relations, I believe, um, and, and spoken to in the motion. So what a licensing program would do as opposed to having a complaint-based system that staff would just have to respond to on a complaint-by-complaint -complaint basis when they come in, and, and we do respond to the ones that we receive now. Um, but what a, a, pro, a program would do from a licensing perspective is require that all residential rental units obtain a license before they're able to rent the unit. So it puts more of a proactivity on the landlord themselves, as opposed to requiring a tenant to identify a specific property standards issue that may exist within their, their unit. So it's taking a bit of a reverse approach to what the city has been able to do on a reactionary basis and create something that is meant to be more proactive in nature. Mr. Smith, I don't know if you have anything else to identify as well, but please add to my answer. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Agnew, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, not really, no, we are relatively sufficiently staffed to do this. If we did implement uh, a more substantive uh, rental licensing, residential licensing program, we may require uh, more municipal law enforcement officers just to be able to do the, the number of inspections that would be required, that would be anticipated, but that will come out through the analysis in the report. Okay, thank you. I, I guess my only other, um, I, I definitely want more information here. I guess my only other concern would be um, we all too often try to regulate ourselves out of problems or create rules and unfortunately there's a lot of good landlords out there and there's also some ones that are um, you know um, absentee landlords that you know might nece might not necessarily follow a lot of these rules in the first place and, and become very good at circumventing them so I'll, I'll, I'll support this I just want to see and, and maybe this is something staff can answer are, are we going to have a way of kind of, I guess, understanding how is the licensing actually really going to address the root of the problem here and not just have those who are already doing a good job continue to do a good job, they'll follow the rules, but how is it actually going to get at the problem ones? And, and I think that that information will come back in, 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 the, in the report itself. Is that kind of the idea here? Commissioner Agnew? Uh, yes, and through you, Your Worship, that's correct, Councillor Bong. So the motion itself directs staff to come back um, in about a year with a report that would have an updated licensing framework. You may recall as a previous member of council that we did bring recommendations on a licensing program that included short-term rentals in 2018, and that work uh, was essentially deferred at the Administrative Policies Committee. So we'll be reissuing that work, having a look at it, seeing if it makes sense in the context of some of the legislative changes. Certainly our, our focus has always been primarily on health and safety. So in order to be able to determine that, there would be inspections that are required as well as the provision of some mandatory information relative to the units that would come in through the application process. But as I, uh, as I indicated, from a regulatory perspective, staff are looking to try to make the process as customer focused as possible, as inexpensive as possible. So what is what is the minimum amount of regulation we would, we would require to be able to address the situation so that the process wouldn't be too or too cumbersome or overly difficult for staff to administer. So that will certainly be part of any type of recommendation that comes back to council. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. I think next is Councillor Stephen. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a question for staff, but is this motion addressing short-term and long-term rentals, or is it just long-term that we're thinking about? 
Um, so, uh, yes, Commissioner Agnew. Uh, thank you, three, Your Worship. The, sta uh, the city already has a rental bylaw requirement for short-term rentals. That's a program we enacted about a year ago, and we do report annually to, to Council on that. So the committee at the time decided to move forward with those recommendations, but the recommendations rel relative to the longer-term rental market were deferred at this time. So. What we'd be bringing back is specifically focused on the long-term rental market as short-term rentals are already covered off in an existing program. Thank you, and just one more follow-up question also for staff, please. Um, this may come as part of your report in a year's time. Uh, are there other municipalities who have enacted this kind of policy with success that you're aware of? Commissioner Agnew? Uh, thank you, and through you. So definitely as part of the work that we did in 2018, we did a assessment of other municipalities that had enacted programs, and we have been following uh, the progress of those municipalities and also some of the challenges that came along with uh, earlier approaches to uh, the rental licensing um, in consideration of, of tenant rights and human rights in particular. So certainly as part of, uh, you know, dusting off the work and having another look, it has been about four years. So we would be including um, any advancements with respect to cities that had programs, any new ones that have, have come on uh, within Ontario municipalities so that you have the most up-to-date information from a best practice perspective. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Agnew. And uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor Glenn, thanks for bringing this up. It's really important. I'm in full support. Thank you. Next is Councillor Ostroff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Ooh, sorry, that's loud. Um, I, you won't have a problem hearing me. Um, thank you. I would like to present an amendment to this motion. And I think the clerk has it. Okay, so... Uh, so I'm just going to read it and then I'll give the floor back to you, Councillor Ostroff. So this is a motion to amend, moved by Councillor Ostroff, seconded by Councillor Bohm. That new motion number three be amended by adding the following to the second, to the end of the second resolve clause. Quote, and that the report include the pros and cons of a rental licensing program and an analysis of other possible options for regulation of rental properties, including maintaining the status quo. Okay, so um, so that's a motion to amend. Um, Councillor Osterhoff, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Mayor Patterson. So I guess we've, we've heard it a little bit from Director uh, Agnew, Commissioner Agnew, and, and so the idea I had here was that we've, there has been a lot of work done already um, in years ago in our last mandate, and, um, and so I, I thought it would be a way of connecting the past and, and making sure that we, we looked at at those that data and uh, and then so that the present to look at it as well we'll consider um, all those things so I just wanted to give it a little more fulsome I don't have a, a lot to say on it but I, I feel it needed a little bit more of a fulsome look and um, this was my our effort to, to do that to be fair thank you okay thank you um, so is there any discussion or debate on the motion to amend only? So just to be clear, this is only discussing whether or not to add the additional wording that Councillor Ostroff has put forward. Uh, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I, I think the intention of the motion, I didn't write the motion, I didn't even second the motion. Uh, I'm just speculating based on the motion. It seems like if we're evaluating a new program and policy, it would already have this framework within it, if I'm not sort of mistaking the reading and the intention of the motion. Um, I, I, I don't have a problem with the amendment as as is. I just think it's a, it's yeah it's already implied within the motion. If you're going to impl implement a new program, you're obviously going to weigh pros and cons of anything new. I, but I, I don't think the the the, mo the amendment is ill intended. I'm just if we're looking at something new, we need to know what the costs and benefits are. I, I think that would normally go in with any motion. So um, yeah, unless Count, unless Councilor Glenn has any further to add pro or con to this pro or con motion. I will vote in favor of it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Bohm, uh, Deputy Mayor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, just to my colleagues' comments there. I, I believe you're 100% right, and that staff would bring that forward. I think what this does, though, is, uh, is from the public perception at a level of transparency that will show that all those things were considered because members of the public reading the motion or perhaps when the media prints it, We'll start to question like were all factors considered was was past things brought forward so the the effort here is just to more say 
what comes forward did consider all those different things, past, present, and, and also it wasn't like we were so prescriptive that here's the only option we want you to research, so please tell us what the best option is. So in this case, we're trying to say, let's look at everything, and from that, what's best practice, what are the best options, what's worked well in other cities. So it's just the intent is to kind of just say, we've looked at this holistically, whatever comes forward from staff is, is, is as well researched as we can possibly get. So, so that's the, a little bit more context behind that. Councillor Glenn. Well, I'm going to be voting against the amendment, and it's because of the status quo comment. I don't think that the status quo is going to cut it in this situation. The purpose behind regulation is to also make sure that everyone is on the same page. So when you look, for example, I'm a regulated healthcare professional, so I can speak to that level of regulation. There are a lot of good practitioners that continue to pay their dues, continue to submit to quality assurance, to ensure that everybody is on that same page. So that's why this motion has been brought forward. It's to ensure that both landlords who are doing the right thing and landlords who maybe aren't are on the same page, that we agree on the standard, that everybody is expected to do the same thing to bring up their properties to the same quality. Now, the mechanism for that can be debated, but I don't think that the status quo is going to cut it. Um, Deputy Bowman, would you take the chair? Yes, Your Worship, and I recognize you. Could I see the amendment back up on the screen, please? Would you like me to read it again? No, I just wanted to make sure that I that I understood it understood it well. So, Councillor Glenn, I completely take your point. Uh, I actually agree with you. But in my view, that is not the key piece to this amendment. All it would say is that including maintaining the status quo would be put forward as one other possible option. I think we can agree that there's a number of us that would agree that that's not necessarily an option. I'm more interested in the space in between. So we have a license, this would say we can have a licensing program, we could have the status quo. Maybe there's something else that's in between. Maybe there are different forms of licensing. Maybe there are additional options that other communities have taken into account. So to me, this is not an exclusive. I don't even suggest, I don't even read this as necessarily pointing or, or promoting the status quo. Uh, to me, I think that the key piece of that motion to amend is the analysis of other possible options. Again, it could very well be that the licensing program uh, as put forward is the best way to go. I certainly don't want to make any firm uh, decisions on that one way or the other until all that information has come forward. But to Councillor Bohm's point, not everybody will be in favor of a licensing program. We will hear from such people probably over the coming months. And so I think being able to say that we've done due diligence and explored all other possible options, including the licensing program, actually probably sets that up for success if that's ultimately what our goal is. So I understand Councillor Glenn's uh, concern. My, my sense on this is that supporting the emotion to amend is actually pushing in the direction you want to go, not in the other direction. So for that reason, I, I'm comfortable to, uh, to support it. Thank you, Your Worship. I return the chair. Anybody else on the motion to amend? Councillor Sun, no. Okay, uh, Councillor Osterhoff, it is your motion to amend. You have the floor if there's anything else that you, uh, that you want to say. Uh, no, I, I appreciate what you said, and I, I hope that um, the, the the original mover would understand that that's not, this is not an idea that we would accept the status quo, which is below standard love living. That's not it at all. I think, uh, as Mayor Patterson will, well said, um, we're going to do our due diligence. That's what it's asking for a little clearer due diligence, set it up for success and, um, you know, for um, pushing it in the right direction is, is what, I re what we really want here. And uh, I'm hopeful that we can support that and give it, uh, give it the, 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 um, the, the depth that it needs. Thank you. Okay, so we will call the vote on the motion to amend. All those in favor? If you just keep your hands up just so I can count. Eight, opposed? Okay, so that carries by a vote of eight to five.
Cancer Tozo, Cancer Ridge, Cancer Sanic, Cancer Glen, and Cancer Shaves opposed. Okay, so now we are on the motion as amended. Councilor Osterhoff, you still have the floor on the main motion if there's anything else that you want to share. Okay, so next on my list uh, is Councilor Amos. Thank you, Your Honor, and through you. Um, like Councilor Glenn, um, my district is quite heavily populated with students, and I talked to a number of them uh, over the, uh, the last previous months. And there, there's uh, one, we have a lot of really, really good landlords um, that are local landlords. Um, and then we seem to have some absentee landlords that have set some subpar standards, especially around our student housing. And the points where students were pointing out to me, no carbon monoxide detectors, no um, smoke detectors, and just basic standard stuff that should be put in place. And it's my understanding that this type of report will per perhaps present a framework for a, a benchmark uh, that can be put forward. So I think it's a, it's a good idea. I really support uh, Councillor's Glenn idea in moving forward with this. Uh, from a Portsmouth district perspective, I will be looking at a very, very keen eye uh, for this type of uh, standard coming forward to protect our most vulnerable uh, renters. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Ridge. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, I just want to start by saying I wholly support this motion um, based on both my personal experience as a renter, specifically as a student living in several very interesting uh, residential units uh, in my early 20s, uh, which uh, did in several cases have uh, severe rodent infestation and uh, very subpar standards. And myself being in a precarious situation at the time didn't really feel like I had the instruments or opportunity to fight back against uh, or stand up for myself in the proper manner. But also from the work that I've done with uh, those are very precarious uh, in my previous employment. Um, so yeah, I just want to say I think that this is uh, really needed. I think that there's a lot of really good intention in here and I look forward to hearing back from uh, city staff about this. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Councilor Hassan. Oh. Councilor Chinani was first. Oh, okay. Councilor Chinani. I just have a few questions. Um, something that Paige Agnew said earlier, but um, I just want a clarification is, would this be only for newly listed rentals or would it also include currently rented units? It was just based on something you had said. Uh, Commissioner Agnew. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So I believe the intention, Councillor, is that uh, any type of licensing program that the city may adopt would apply to all residential units, existing ones, and any new ones that would come on the market as well as part of new construction. And um, would how how um, do the other municipalities share their data? Are they very open at sharing all the data they have, or are they kind of? Uh, do they hold on to some things where they don't share? Um. Uh, thank you through your worship. So it, it would depend on the nature of the data that you're looking for. A lot of municipalities that have programs um, of this nature, they require the actual license to be somehow visibly posted, similar to what you'd see for a business license or a building permit if there's a project that's under construction. So from that standpoint, being able to, to notify a member of the public or a tenant that there is an active license or possibly having it as part of any type of listing associated with that. Um, data associated with non-compliance is something that's a little bit more difficult. Certainly anything that would uh, be going through a process of enforcement, uh, there's very little information that the city is able to share legally in that process until a matter is completed. So again, it, it depends on the type of data that you're looking for, and, and some of that will also be part of uh, reassessing the best practice research to see if anything has changed since we had a, a look at it in 2018. And uh, one more question. Um, would it be possible to include a green incentive program into this licensing where, because I know that you talk about a grace period of getting your uh, property up to standard where 
there could be, we could integrate a green initiative there where they could apply for funding or, or it would be a, a good opportunity to get um, more green, uh, green technology or, or being greener at the rental unit level, which is, uh, from my understanding, much more difficult to get. Uh, Commissioner Hugo Boss. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, your, your Worship, and, uh, and through you. So, um, yeah, we can, uh, with our climate leadership group, we can definitely uh, work with staff on, uh, on getting the information back to council. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have right now with the Better Homes Kingston is, is existing um, uh, existing homes that uh, the owners can, ap can apply for, for um, incentives to, to make their homes more uh, green more climate friendly. Um, there's also a program for, for new construction uh, with the green energy uh, CIP. Uh, and also we could uh, work with uh, Commissioner Agnes group on, uh, on where the building code is going because a lot of the new construction over the next few years is, is destined to be um, more, um, uh, more geared towards lower, lower GHG emissions and, and new construction. So uh, yes, Councillor, we can uh, we can add information in. Okay, Councillor Tanani, anything else? Okay, Councillor Hassan. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, through you. Uh, I'd like to uh, say thank you to Councillor Glenn and appreciate her motion to uh, bringing on the table. And uh, I want to witness that, what she described in her, mo um, her motion working with a lot of international students and hearing the story from them, uh, how poor condition uh, the uh, places, they, uh, how, how badly uh, maintained the houses or the apartment uh, are by the um, landlords where they are living in. Uh, many landlords putting you know, way more people into the one room what they're supposed to be. Instead, one or two people, they're putting three or four people renting uh, the room by per, per person, not per room. Um, and the condition of the houses are very bad. Uh, the one incident, particularly one of my employees living in a uh, room, the roof was leaking. And he keep complaining for two years. And finally, he got a notice of eviction. And then the landlord did not uh, replace that roof. So having those uh, stories uh, or hearing the, those stories, I'm definitely uh, in the favor of to putting something in place, but also I cannot deny that it's a lot of good uh, landlord out there who take care of their business and seriously, and then they have a passion to serve their, their, their client. But also the same number of landlords who are taking advantage of the, uh, of the people, especially with the vulnerable community or the international student. And definitely I like to support the, this motion, but I have a question to the staff, how the licensing will help to improve the condition of the property by the landlord and help the uh, renters to have a better property, how is going to take place? Commissioner Agnew. Commissioner Agnew, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, a couple of ways, Councillor Hassan. I think um, primarily through a licensing program, there would be a few things that staff would be looking for through the application process. We'd certainly be looking to establish if the units were legally created and if we have proper records of um, the permitting process associated with the construction of those units or um, any type of uh, historical paperwork that would identify like what inspections were done as part of that. Um, so we would be looking at that on, on certainly the background side and on the, on the regulatory side. Um, potentially as well too, we're also looking at having to do inspections. So inspections um, of the units themselves, if there were clear visual um, things that were identified that were deficiencies, we would have processes by way of requiring the property owner to bring those into compliance with the applicable law that, that applies to, to that particular matter. So I think in a couple of streams, we would be dealing with um, deficient units and then requiring through the process of the different mechanisms that we have to be able to require those properties to be brought up to standard and certainly that being a requirement being it be prior to being able to issue a license for them. Thank you, Worship. 
Okay, Deputy Mayor Bohm, you've uh, all... Yes, that doesn't matter. <laughs> good, good try, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> so, um, is there anybody that has not spoken that wishes to speak? The only person that I can speak again is Councillor Glenn, is the mover of the motion. So, Councillor Glenn, go ahead. Um, first, I'd like to thank all my colleagues for their thoughtful input. Uh, regulation is a difficult task, and it's not something that I think anyone really wants to have to do or wants to have to participate in, and I wish that we could rely on the goodwill of everyone out there who is a landlord. It's an unfortunate circumstance that we cannot. Uh, so this is why licensing or regulation uh, becomes something that we have to do. Now, it can be done thoughtfully. It can be done with consideration for allowing everyone to come up to the standard that's expected. Uh, so this doesn't have to be a heavy-handed approach. And I think this is where it's important that staff do come back with a program that is uh, something that everyone can implement uh, and have time to implement. So it's not to dissuade people from being landlords, but it's to encourage them to be good landlords. Uh, so this is one of the, the big things we, that I think we need to consider when we're looking at this. And ultimately, back to the core of why this motion was brought forward, is to protect the health, safety, and well-being of the citizens. Uh, in Sydenham District, mostly the renters are students. These are our youth who still yet have not quite grasped what they need to do sometimes in order to take good care of themselves. And so if we can lend them an extra hand by making sure that at least when they go away from home, they have a safe place to be, because uh, I certainly wouldn't have wanted my children to live in unsafe housing away from home. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote on new motion three as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, new motion number four, moved by Councillor Shave, seconded by Councillor Glenn. Whereas aquatic services are critical to community quality of life and well-being, whereas the City of Kingston endorsed its updated Parks and Recreation Master Plan in 2021, which identified the need for the city to continue to monitor pool utilization and aquatics programming demand. Whereas aquatic services accessible to Kingston residents were reduced in 2022, with the closure of the indoor pool in Amherstview, as well as the temporary, temporary closure of Queen's University indoor pool. Where City Council approved a partnership for the construction of an aquatic facility in Loyalist in 2019 and received an information report on the cost of building and operating a new city-owned aquatic center in 2022. Whereas the federal government announced a grant of $16.5 million to the construction of a new aquatic facility in Loyalist Township. Therefore, be resolved that Council directs staff to report back to the Arts, Recreation, Community Policies Committee in Q3 2023 with information on options, partnerships, timelines, and costs associated with the expansion addition of aquatic services accessible to Kingston residents. Councillor Shaves, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I'll keep this short, considering this is a direction of staff to report back. Um, I know during the summer I had conversation cut short, talking to residents, uh, because they're queuing up their, all their electronic devices to try to win the swimming lesson um, lottery. Uh, and also, I didn't also heard from non-swimmers, uh, hockey parents in which when they go to tournaments outside the city, they have other amenities at the arenas um, for either in between games or even those who are not hockey fans. They can go to the gym, they can go to a restaurant, they can go swimming, uh, which is something that we're lacking. Uh, and I heard that a couple times. But it's not just that. We, we pride ourselves in being a sports tourism uh, community. Uh, we can do sports tourism in a number of different fields, soccer, baseball, anything on the ice, uh, hockey, uh, curling, broom ball. Um, we've done pickleball. Um, but one thing we can't do is swimming. Uh, there is no 50 meter pool within the, the city limits that we can uh, host any swimming tournaments. Uh, I also heard is, Queens itself can can host their own tournaments. Uh, I, I spoke with someone uh, as, as well as the Blue Marlins. So if we can do that, um, it would also bring back uh, money into the local economy. Uh, we're set up for that with hotels, restaurants, and shopping in the West End, but that will also swing out to the rest of the city. But we need even when all the swimming facilities 
are operational within the Kingston area, it was still not sufficient. Constantly heard complaints about that. So we do need an extra one, even if everyone's 100% operational. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else that wishes to speak to the motion? Councillor Glenn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm in support of this, but for some different reasons. So here in Kingston, we have an aging demographic. Um, we also are lacking pools that are accessible to those who have disabilities or are looking to do therapeutic um, treatment in pool. So one of us is in a pool setting. Um, so one of the things is, is in a pool setting. Um, so one of the things that I'm hoping will come out of this is that we also, um, and, and I'm going to ask staff to, in their plan, give consideration to this, an actual therapeutic pool. Um, we don't really have one in the city. Presently, for example, veterans um, who might be um, needing that kind of therapy will go to a facility like Hydra Athletics, which is an excellent facility. But once they're discharged, there is not an appropriate place for most of them to go to continue to exercise appropriately um, to maintain their function and standard of life. So from the other aspects, I think we could use more pools here. I've also heard from residents who are saying, I go to my local pool, but it's busy, it's packed. Uh, so accessibility isn't just about being able to get into the pool, it's also about having it close by, being able to actually get the time that they need in the pool to do the activities that they want to do, whether it's swimming or it's some sort of pool therapy. So I'm supporting moving forward with this to see what we can do to better improve service for our citizens. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Just a quick question to staff. Uh, the term aquatic services, clearly it means pools, but by any chance does that mean anything else, like splash pads, wading pools, anything like that? Or are we talking like, you know, Olympic-sized pools only? See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Uh, Mayor. <clears throat> so primarily pool, but could also mean access to programs or services in pools that are not necessarily owned by the city. So we do have other partners that do own pools in the city, so we need to look at those options as well. And is there a way that we could provide basically uh, Kingston residents to better access to those facilities that are existing? So not splash pads or wading pools? Through Mr. Mayor, does not uh, include splash pad and wading pools, um, not from my understanding of the motion. Okay, uh, next on my list is Deputy Mayor Bohm and then Councillor Sanek. Deputy Mayor Bohm. Thank you, Worship, and through you, I wholeheartedly support this. Uh, I know that uh, Councillor Sanek and I have had many conversations about the lack of uh, pools in Kingston, and I'm honestly going to say it's probably uh, one of the things I hear about the most. It's probably also one of the most costly uh, things to try to add to the city with ongoing operational costs. So uh, I'd like to thank the mover and seconder for bringing this forward because realistically, now that we have an example of a higher level of government coming to the table with a significant amount of funding, we know that there's precedent there. So we know that this is something that we could probably access. Uh, capital costs notwithstanding, a lot of the concern with pools actually uh, revolve around their uh, ongoing operating costs. Uh, I believe it's upwards of over a million dollars just because of the chemicals and all the health requirements and everything. Counter to that is the fact that residents uh, are of an aging population, as well as kids, I believe swimming is, is a very important life skill, especially in Canada. Um, and so residents uh, in an aging population can use pools for uh, exercise that they might not in other words be able to access and also rehabilitative, me rehabilitative measures. So looking at the current spread across the city, it's, it's obvious that we have a deficit in aquatic facilities. And uh, there's no doubt the West End definitely needs access to more and the East End as well. So I'm, I'm glad that this will explore partnerships. But uh, I also think that, you know, those partnerships also come with an inherent level of risk because those partners can fold if we don't own the facility, right? So I'm thinking of some of the existing partnerships and facilities can go under, facilities cannot be maintained. So I, I do like the idea of partnerships sort of as a stopgap measure, but I'd also like to see uh, as part of this plan, you know, s staff also consider like how can the city actually get more pools that, that we own on our own and recognizing there will be a cost to that and there has to be a strate strategic plan, but I definitely don't want to see adding pools uh, become the, the next Waban cross.
crossing where it takes 60 years for us to get the facilities added. Sorry, I had to work that in there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Councilor Sinek. Thank you, Worship. I support this motion as well. I do have one question to staff. <clears throat> so before COVID in 2019, when council agreed to um, partner with Loyalist, right, for um, the renovation of their swimming pool, and then their pool had to close and the funding didn't come through, with that grant of $16.5 million they just received, um, do we, are, are we giving money to Loyalists um, for, you know, the rest of the cost of their pool, or what happened to that partnership with Loyalist? Sayo Hurdle. Thank you, and through Mr. Mayor, I actually had a meeting last week uh, with representatives from Loyalist Township. So they they will be obviously proceeding with their project now that they've been able to secure some uh, grant funding. Um, we will still like to continue the partnership that we had started to explore. There will be new information that we will be bringing to council shortly because obviously things have changed since 2019. And the grant that they've received also has certain parameters or requirements. So we will be bringing that back in early 2023 to, uh, to council to provide a bit more information and what the, the partnership exactly, the structure can look like. Thank you. Uh, I would still rather have our own facility at the Infista Center like we planned back in 2009. So that's my definite, that's my you know ultimate dream and goal. Um, also, like during COVID, we saw that seven percent increase in our in our population, and a lot of people came from Toronto and at the doors during the election. I heard from people saying, where's your swimming pool? Like, I have to go all the way down to Artillery Park. That's your only pool for all of Kingston. You know, I've come from a place where there's a pool, like, in every corner and easy to get swimming lessons. And so those that new part of our population, that's their expectation. And, uh, yeah, they were really shocked to find out what our swimming, you know, facilities are really like. I also heard at the door that... The nightmare that some parents are going through so when registration opens at that point where registration opens you have to have yeah you have to have your phone on you have to have your laptop you have to have your husband's laptop on you have to have all your kids you know going on 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 like trying to get those swimming spots and um, when I went through that, I don't know, back in 2010 or so, I was hoping that those days were over. You know, for me, that was like YMCA, Artillery Park, and it's still going on. And here we are in uh, 2022. So I support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? Yes, Your Worship, and I recognize you. Thank you. So I think there's just two really important things to know about pools. First, pools are great. <laughs> Second, pools are very, very expensive. So I'm happy to support this motion. Um, I, I will say that ordinarily I would have suggested that council, this would be something that we should bring forward in our strategic planning session. However, um, as you recall, I think when there's a time-sensitive element, I've said that that is absolutely time for a motion. And, Councillor Shaves, you're right. There's a time-sensitive element here because there are active partnership opportunities available to us right now that I think we really need to, to explore. I am very supportive of smart, strategic ways to be able to expand aquatic services in such a way that doesn't break the bank <laughs> because there are a lot of other fiscal pressures that we're facing as a city. I think we just have to understand and recognize that. And to be clear, right, that might involve some short-term solutions to expand access, and maybe there's a longer-term project that's involved here, but quite frankly, then we may need to be talking about advocacy with other levels of government, as Loyalist Township has done with their facility. So I'm happy to get the ball rolling. Lots of discussion to happen here, but... Um, uh, we'll see what comes back from staff. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I return the chair. Thank you. Next time, this is Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, I admit I have not yet uh, jumped into the deep end on the buying a pool. You're going to get a few of those. Uh, 
So I'm still waiting in the shallow end of whether or not this will be operational uh, down the road. One thing I would ask staff in all seriousness, I think the initial, we need to partner with other levels of government, but the operational costs I think are something that we really do have to take a look at what this will be in the next few years. And I am significantly worried about the impact on our budget from the machinations of the upper of the provincial government and what that will do in putting this forward. So I, sh I, I share Mayor Patterson's caution about this. Uh, so I, I, I certainly hope that we get uh, a lot of good information from this and we get a good partnership and that this council can make a big splash. Thank you. Councilor Tozo, that was, there was like one pun per minute in, in that. That was very, very impressive. Thank you. Uh, next is Councilor Hassan. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, once again, I'd like to share the stories about the pools. Uh, uh, my few years ago, my older son is uh, 19 now, and then when he was two years old, my wife does not drive and uh, don't speak very good English. Getting a swimming lesson for him at the Y, she has to wake me up at the midnight when I go home, 10 o'clock after work, and I'm just trying to sleep and say, okay, let me have a nap for two hours and wake me up when you see the things going on in the computer. And then sometime I have to drive her at this uh, 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. at the uh, YMCA to get into the line so she can get the registration done. That was a frustration with the three children and living in the West End from 20 years. And being a West Ender, I'm a very fan of the, this project. And I have been talking to you even before coming to the council many times when you was a councillor that we need that. So last two campaigns, the first campaign where I ran 2018 and this campaign, I have the same uh, comments and question from the people that we need the pool. And pool is that our city need to um, create more Olympians in, in the swimmings. Our uh, city need to have more uh, sports children and uh, for the healthy community, I think that uh, pool is very essential in our area, especially at the West End. So when we talk about the cost, we witness all of us the 50 or 60 years for the third crossing. And with the same comment we are putting on the table today, it's too expensive. We're not going to do it. We're not going to be there. And then we have a city divided in, in two. You know, half of the city is in the favor of it, and half of the city not favor of because of the cost. Once we initiate the, this project, I am sure that we will find the way to build it. Not today, um, like the uh, Councillor Tozo said. What is, can you hear guys? Okay. The Councillor Tozo said that he's in the shallow side of the pool, but I am sitting on the edge of the shallow side of the pool. So I'm not expecting it done in a year or two, but as, as long as we initiate the, the process, then I think we will be able to see the pool in the West End someday. And I definitely, wholeheartedly, I will support this. And this is not only for Councillor um, uh, Chaves or uh, Osanic and uh, Stevenson. We're all four of us. We had a West End, and the West End need the pool, and definitely need the pool, and we need to support that pool. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Amos. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, I just, uh, Councillor uh, Shaves and I have had a couple conversations about this, and I fully, fully endorse it. This adds a quality of life to our, uh, to our city that will, will not be seen for a very long time. We have not built a new pool uh, for years. And it's it's showing, and so for us to to start this exploration of doing of having a report brought back, um, for us to do a review, uh, my my question to staff is, if if in their estimation, the existing infrastructure at Invista um, is there room there to put a pool, or are we looking at the possibility of purchasing additional land? So, so Councilor Amos, I know that the, the motion is asking for a number of different options, and so that might be included in the report. I'm not sure if staff have any additional comments. CEO Hurdle. Thank you, Anthony, Mr. Mayor. It will definitely be included in the report, but I just want to flag that uh, when the Invista Center was designed many years ago, which I worked on, um, there was actually a space identified for a potential future pool. So that 
definitely is one of the options that we will be looking at. Thank you, CAO Hurdle. And uh, my memory was long, and that's I purposely asked that, knowing that that was coming out. So thank you for supporting that. <laughs> Um, I don't think we're wandering in shark-infested waters here. I think we're going to have a great opportunity to support our our, uh, our community. And uh, off to you uh, to uh, to council to review. I fully support it. Thank you. Does anybody else have any pool jokes that they want to get out? While we're... We got it. We got it all out. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, anybody else that has not spoken that wants to speak, Councillor Chinani. I don't have any puns though, but um, I think this is like a great opportunity, especially from, uh, it's pretty exciting from a tourism perspective um, and possible partnerships and uh, also from a health perspective. Um, I think it's much needed and hopefully that this report can bring back some really great news about funding and partnerships and yeah, I fully support this. Okay, thank you. There's nobody else that wishes to speak. Councillor Shaves, you have the last word. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their support. And before I rest here, I certainly hope that Councillor Tozo receives a pickleball paddle and some water wings underneath the tree <laughs> uh, as, as we get our feet wet. <laughs> okay. On that note, we will call the vote on new motion number four. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, new motion number five, moved by Councillor San, seconded by Councillor Tozo, whereas the city has made great strides toward building measurable service standards throughout the continued implementation and expansion of the city's customer relationship management system, CRM, whereas residents in the city of Kingston would benefit from increased awareness of existing department-specific customer service standards and legislative response timelines, whereas the city remains committed to identifying opportunities to improve upon current practices, while continuing to deliver services to the community with the goal of achieving customer service excellence. Therefore, be it resolved the council directs staff to incorporate the development of organization-wide customer service standards into the city's 2023 work plan. Councilor Sun, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, this motion is um, very dear to me, and uh, I have been thinking uh, from long time to uh, is, you know, uh, as, as a citizen to bring to the council's attention. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that city staff is doing a great job and they are trying to provide the best they can in when it's uh, come to the service or serve the citizens. But there are still um, some issues up there. During the campaign, again, I heard a lot from the uh, Trillium uh, resident and I am sure if I'm not sure that I hope that uh, all the other uh, councillors heard from their uh, areas and their districts um, as well at some level. The People's R was, uh, was complaining about when they call the city or send the email, most of the time they don't hear with the, within the timely manners. Uh, Sometimes they hear, but then it's no follow-up time on it. And for the follow-up time, they have to call them or they have to email them many times then no response. Um, during the campaign, again, I have witnessed a couple of them, and uh, I saw their email uh, thread. It was uh, one person was showing me 10 email about one uh, stoplight he, he wanted to acquire about it was the, um, with, with the timing issue on, on that one. And the other uh, gentleman, he showed me the email as well. It was uh, six or seven emails for the potholes in on his street. And he has a car repair bill in his hand, which he showed me that how much it cost uh, to him to repair his car because of those those, those potholes. So those two incidents, I, I just witnessed it. And then I thought it's a good idea to we look into the matter how we can provide a better in excellent service to our citizen. They deserve that, the best of the, the best service we have. It's not that we don't have available the service. We just probably need to put the new mechanism to make sure that people are getting um, feedback or a response back to their queries within the time. And then it's the time set for um, the uh, follow-up 
uh, for, for, for there. And then also we will need to maybe look into how we can make sure that their complaint has been uh, taken care of it. For that, that reason, um, uh, I brought this um, motion to my uh, colleagues' attention and, and to the staff' attention, we need to look into that. It's, it's a very important. The citizens deserve the, the better service. They are the taxpayer. They, they're living in, in the city. And they have all the right to ask the, the question. And they deserve the uh, reply back within the timely manner. OK, thank you. Uh, is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Rich. Um, thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I was just wondering if uh, the sta city staff would be able to give us an explanation of the current uh, customer service system in terms of feedback and, and time uh, expectations. Uh, Commissioner Carboni. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, to the councillor. Um, the city has been implementing a, a CRM system over the past two years, uh, which is really the prerequisite to be able to establish the customer service standards that uh, the Councillor Hassan is talking about. Um, that being said, it is not as though customer service standards don't exist. They exist on more of a piecemeal basis, or um, some of those standards are not necessarily publicized at this point. So various departments do attempt to observe um, certain customer service standards. And other departments um, uh, also have legislative standards that they must meet. So those things are in place, and um, I would I would I would guess that the customer service responsiveness, um, the types of of examples that the councillor is mentioning, are still kind of in the minority. But uh, there is always room for improvement. And without having that full accountability mechanism in place through a CRM, things can slip through the cracks. So now that we are implementing the full CRM, we'll have the mechanisms to have that accountability and be able to have data and metrics to track and things that we will be able to improve upon moving forward. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I, I'm going to support this. And uh, just just based on my experience over the last eight years, we, we've made some great strides here. But uh, some of the concerns and examples that I still have are where um, we don't necessarily always close the loop. Um, so what will happen is, you know, personal experiences. You may send something in on behalf of a, a resident. That's a that's a concern, and uh, you know, some time will go by, and there are often times where, and I know staff's working on this, but the resident will get the loop closed but you don't because you're, you're somehow cut out of that. What can oftentimes happen though is you'll get the answer, but then it doesn't necessarily go to the resident or nobody hears anything and you just kind of have to assume and then somebody will come back a year later and go, hey, did you ever get an answer on that? And you're kind of like, uh, no, I thought you did. So it's as counselors, I, I know we don't have time with every single contact us um, issue that comes in to literally track ever, I do my best, I have a folder, but like when something falls through, some of those answers come within a day, which is amazing. Other ones are much more detailed and can take months. Some of the most complicated submissions that I can think of will be something where there's six different questions within one submission. And you send that in and there's no way for one person or there doesn't, isn't a current way right now so when it goes in, my understanding is, let's say it has to go to four or five different departments. Those answers will come in in different pieces. So you're now trying to sort of track like what was answered, what wasn't. But there's nothing to close the loop to say like, hey, all of these have been dealt with. All of these have been closed. So that resident with six different questions spanning all these different areas, we've answered them all because it kind of comes in at different times. So it's almost like somebody needs to pick up that problem initially and follow it through to all the different departments, compiling the answers, and then and then hand it back at the end and say, here you go. Because when it comes piecemeal, sometimes I think that's where the issue happens. And all of these are things that every city struggles with, right? Especially some of these are easy answers, some of them are hard. So I think our whole thing here is we have a good system, but we're working to make it great. And this is gonna be a constantly moving target. So we need these benchmarks and we need a plan to continually make it better. And I think part of that is to look at some of the areas where it has improved, recognize that, but also look at areas where it still needs improvement. And uh, I'm, I'm sure staff are fully on board with this as well because 
having to answer the same email multiple times actually reduces their efficiency overall and wastes time. And sometimes through nobody's fault, I swear sometimes there's a ghost in this system because it'll just disappear or, or an answer that somebody will say got out to you and you're reading your email and you're like, I, I never got that, but, but it was sent. So I think there's also some technical issues and where there's this ghost server that has a lot of our solved issues, but nobody ever sees the answers. So if anybody finds that server, let me know. So anyways, I think this is a great initiative. I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Glenn. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I heard similar issues as I was campaigning, that there was a concern about not being responded to quickly or in a timely fashion. Um, but a question to staff, is there uh, a timeline for follow-up, even if there isn't an answer? Uh, oftentimes in other systems, you know, there's at least you know, hey, it's been a week, we're, we're at least going to have a touch point. So is that currently part of the system. Commissioner Coburny. Uh, through your worship to the councillor, uh, there is currently a feedback mechanism so that the responsible staff within each department that uh, is kind of the administrator for that department's CRM will get notified if something has not been closed. Uh, what we are in the process of implementing this year is um, an expansion of that so that if things remain unclosed, uh, we can escalate that up an accountability chain uh, and that we can provide metrics uh, to staff uh, on the response rates and the closure rates. So we are still implementing parts of those systems, but uh, the functionality is there. And uh, just another question, and this is with regards to quality of responses. So is staff provided with education on sort of how to respond. I do understand that sometimes files are difficult um, and replies, particularly in email, can come across as terse. And, you know, we want to make sure that residents know that we're happy to respond to their inquiries. And so are, is there any sort of education to staff on um, how to craft replies that um, are polite, shall we say? Uh, through your worship, uh, there is uh, customer service training that is provided to uh, certainly the frontline customer experience staff, and they're able to respond uh, to most uh, probably typical questions that will come in or inquiries that will come in through the Contact Us system. Um, I couldn't speak to all of the CX training that is provided at the other department levels, uh, but that is something that we are looking at as part of the system improvement this year. Okay, uh, anybody else on new motion number five? Councillor Shaves. Is every department included in the system? Uh, through your worship, the majority of city departments uh, or business units as they're classified for the purpose of CRM uh, are being enrolled into the system. There are some uh, that uh, are uh, still in the works right now. We should have the majority wrapped up this year, uh, and there's some additional functionality of lower volume business units that will occur in the first part of 2023. Uh, but over the past two years, um, all, almost all departments have been put onto the system. So considering that not every department is included in the system at the current time, could that be one of the reasons why there are some difficulties within the system? Uh, through your worship, there's a couple of reasons why probably during the campaign and some of the concerns that were heard could be attributed to some of those departments maybe not being on board to the system yet and so greater potential for inquiries to slip through the cracks or maybe not get responded to uh, as timely as they should. Um, but probably a greater uh, cause is that the functionality of the system um, doesn't always identify all inquiries uh, with the correct accountability. And so that's part of the upgrade process through 2023 is making sure that when something comes in, it's classified correctly because without those classifications, the accountability isn't there. It's difficult for the CX agents to actually assign those. And then consequently, there isn't kind of a, a lot of those inquiries will go into a general pool. Um, and then it's difficult to provide any useful metrics from all the inquiries that are in the general pool. Whereas once the classifications are there, uh, we can better um, assign responsibility and then see how different departments are doing with their responses. So there have been strides over the past couple of years.
Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hassan, do you have the last word? If there's anything else you want to say? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm just going to uh, share. And since I got uh, elected, um, I have two complaints came to me. One was resolved within 30, 36 hours. And one is more than two weeks. It's still pending. And that is very minor complaint. That complaint is, has issued the reference number and just need a garbage can in that neighborhood which was taken away during the construction. That's it. And since that, I, I have I was CC'd because I received that email and then I uh, give it to, um, I, I, I forward to Amanda and Amanda forward to the department and we got the reference number. I'm still on the uh, list, but I haven't seen the response on, on my side. I don't know if somebody con contacted to the complainer uh, directly. So it's more than a two weeks. It's just for a garbage can need to be replaced. Put it up there. So I, I think what, what I learned um, with the um, having a conversation with the people on, on the doors, they just need acknowledgement for, for their inquiries that that's the first step. Resolving the issue is the second step. And there, there was complaining about not even, with the current CRM system now we see they are, people are getting the reference number, but before the people was talking about, they, they never heard anything about it. So we should have some kind of a mechanism to recognize or acknowledge their complaint. And then the follow-up time, that's two important, uh, I think, the uh, steps to uh, giving a, a best customer service to the, the people. So acknowledging the first place and the follow-up you know, the time to follow up that, that complaint, how far they are. So once the citizen or the resident know that, where they are, there's somebody looking into it, I think they will stay calm and they will uh, waiting to resolve it, even if it takes a little bit uh, longer time. So when they don't hear at all, that's how they, they get frustrated and they start cursing us as a politician and then they curse the staff as well. So, you know, we are the one who's gonna face them after four years again. So that's why this motion is very important. Working together with the staff and the, uh, as a counselor, I think is very important. So both we, we can uh, improve this, um, the customer service standard by working together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote on new motion number five. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, new motion number six, moved by Councillor Glenn, second by Councillor McLaren. Whereas our healthcare system is chronically underfunded, COVID-19 is still with us. Influenza season is here and a particularly violent strain affecting children is overwhelmed hospitals across the province. Whereas this council of the city of Kingston has a desire to support critical frontline healthcare workers directly involved in patient care that need parking passes the most, employees that cannot take a break from patient care to line up for a parking pass or renew a meter. Therefore be it resolved that city council waive on street parking permit fees for up to 300 temporary permits for two months for going budgeted parking revenue of approximately $7,500 per month on neighborhood streets in proximity to Kingston General Hospital and Hotel Du Hospital sites. And that these vehicle parking permits be provided by Kingston Health Sciences Center to their critical frontline healthcare workers directly involved in patient care that would most benefit from this temporary parking access. And that to ensure proper distribution, those who most need are considered to be those at the lower end of the pay scale, those who work long hours, those who cannot take breaks because they have patients to care for. And the council directs staff to continue to enforce all other parking regulations, including metered on and off street parking, as well as neighborhood street parking and overnight winter parking, according to City of Kingston Bylaw 2010-128, a bylaw to regulate parking. And that staff consider longer term options to ease the plight of overworked hospital employees in relation to parking, such as but not limited to more park and rides and more long term parking. And that staff report back with some options for longer term solutions by third quarter 2023. Councilor Glenn, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I think we all are well aware of just how difficult it's been for our frontline healthcare workers. Um, but the lack of reporting in the news about what the continued situation is uh, leaves us sort of, I think, forgetful that they're still suffering. So certainly, you know, when I hear from an emergency room doctor that the biggest thing that they would like for Christmas are more nurses and PSWs, and that those people are stressed reporting sick and having to attend to children right now who are very, very ill. We know that we're having children transported to our hospital. Um, the last thing that we need healthcare workers to be worried about 
is where they're going to park. So I understand that this is, uh, comes with a bit of a cost, but I think it's a long-term problem, which is why the uh, final part of this motion is to let's work on permanent solution where you know it's, it's not so much about providing free parking forever, but parking that's reasonable, accessible, so somebody can go to work, um, attend to those who are in most need, and do so without having to worry about where their car is, whether they're going to get ticketed. Um, so I don't want to see my friends, family, or myself, I'm knock on wood, uh, going to the hospital and having a, work, a healthcare worker distracted by something as small as parking. So I hope that you'll support this. Um, I think that this um, is critical, especially given the time of year that we provide some extra support and given the crisis that we're seeing now with our children in healthcare. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Boehm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. So there was obviously uh, some discussion back and forth between uh, between some of us uh, about this motion and this concern, and, and it's no secret that this has come before council before. And I think, uh, as as Councillor Grelin mentioned, the. Uh, the, the real crux of this motion is the, is the longer term solution here. So we can keep saying, yes, a couple months free parking, a couple months free parking, but let's be honest with ourselves. This problem is not going away. The strains on the healthcare system are real. They're only gonna increase with an aging population. Um, we've all heard reports, uh, my own sister-in-law is an NP as well, and uh, currently up north, and, and when she comes back and she works here, the strain on the healthcare system is unreal. You've got people with 25-year careers just walking away from them because of the stress on the system. So when you hear that and, and, and you're aware of it, and then you start hearing these stories of, well, I had to use my five-minute break instead of eating, you know, or grabbing something to drink or going to the bathroom to run out and feed a meter. There's a real problem there. And one of the things, you know, the horror stories we heard the last time is we've, we've taken a couple of cracks at this and it was that the passes that were there ended up going out to a lot of admin staff or office staff and not the frontline workers who actually needed it. So I think one of the main things with this is, is we have the right intention. We're just not sure how to execute it properly to get the end result that we want. And we all know the result that we want is to remove that stress from those frontline workers. And I think part of the solution here is actually gonna be some form of partnership with either um, Kingston Health Sciences Center or, or some other form of uh, Good Samaritan out there or somebody else that can come up with an idea of how we can provide this longer term solution because it may even be looking at our, our own rules and laws down there for parking where you know if it's, if it's healthcare staff that are providing that essential community service, maybe they do get a 12 hour permit or maybe they, maybe they pay once or maybe a monthly pass or something like that. There, there is a better solution here. I like the stopgap measure, but I think this might be the third time we've done this now. So there's a longer and deeper issue here that we need to solve. So I, I'm not, I'm pretty sure everybody's gonna support this. <laughs> so with that, uh, you know, I, I, I thank the mover and the seconder and I know there was some great conversation uh, that happened beforehand to kind of to form this motion. And it's something that really is of concern to the entire city when our healthcare workers who are already extremely stressed to the max have to chase down, you know, a meter and try to feed it. And, and I mean, it's 2022, I'm pretty sure we can solve this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor McLaren. Thank you, and just a quick question to staff. We put it in as a placeholder. Is third quarter 2023 uh, adequate time for you? Or would you leave less time or perhaps more time? So I see Mr. Smith. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Worship, uh, Ms., uh, your Worship. Uh, yeah, I, we believe that uh, third quarter 2023, we would be able to have some more options available for this. Uh, we already have a few things in play uh, regarding certain uh, more permits in various areas and some park and rides and things like that. So I think that a third quarter 2023 uh, timeline initially anyway would be well achievable. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, the next point is uh, I can't stress enough how this shouldn't go to the same people that got it last time. This is for people who missed out on it last time because they were working. And uh, if we can make that as clear as possible to um, Kingston Health Science Center, um, we've tried to do that by changing the wording a little bit. Uh, critical frontline healthcare workers directly involved in patient care. Um, 
it didn't seem to be communicated to them or they didn't get it last time as well as we had hoped. Um, we hope that this gets communicated to them and they figure out the best way to distribute these. Other than that, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? Yes, Your Worship, and I recognize you. So I will support this. Um, this is probably, the th as has been said, probably the third or fourth time that we've done this. But I think it's important to voice a couple of concerns that I have with this at the same time. Number one, we've been very focused on hospital healthcare employees, and I think we should agree that there are many healthcare workers in our community who are not at the hospital who are very much under similar stress given the current state of our healthcare system. So I think we just need to note that. The second thing that I would suggest is that I think given the current challenges that our healthcare system is facing, I'm no longer convinced that parking is the number one concern that's being faced. And there could be other strategic ways that as a city we may, if we do have resources, may want to look at ways that we can support that. Not taking this away, but to be honest, there are other bigger, larger structural pieces that are ahead of us. And so I'm happy to support it, see what we can do with parking, but I would also ask council perhaps that we need to step back from, from that parking piece and talk about, okay, what are some other ways that we can assist on this file? So I will support this. I'm not sure that I would support it again because I just think that, you know, yes, it's $7,500 per month, but well, think about what we could do with that money, for example, in doctor recruitment. Think about what we could do in perhaps some other strategic ways to be able to assist on this file. So I will vote for this, but I would encourage council to, to move on and to say how do we, how do we help to really make the, the biggest impact we can, understanding that this is a provincial area of responsibility, understanding all those pieces, but making sure that we can leverage our dollars as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship, and I return the chair. Okay, anybody else on new motion number six? Councilor Glenn, is there anything else you wanted to add? Keep it short, because uh, as previously mentioned, we're headed into holidays. Um, that was, you know, to your points, Mr. Mayor, uh, that's why we wanted a longer term solution. I think parking is going to continue to be a pressure in the city. Uh, yes, it's low hanging fruit. There are numerous structural uh, issues in healthcare of which I think a number of us are well aware. And hopefully we can find some solutions, some added benefit that we can give to our healthcare providers here in the city. Uh, but that's for strategic planning and uh, we're a few months away from that. So hopefully this will at least give them a small uh, measure of uh, relief and show them that they have our continued support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote on new motion number six. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and that's carried. Okay, so we have no other new motions tonight. Um, so I'm just going to make a comment. Staff don't know that I'm gonna make this comment um, and they probably would never say this. But uh, we're off to a strong start as a new council, but our last two council meetings, including this one, we've had five or six new motions. That's not sustainable going forward. There is an enormous amount of foundational work that needs to happen in 2023 with our budget, with strategic planning. Staff have a lot of their work to do, and so I am going to just ask an appeal to council, myself included, um, that we're obviously careful with uh, with new motions. Obviously, there can still be time-sensitive stuff that comes up, but to try to make sure that we're also uh, giving staff the capacity to uh, tackle all the other important work that's ahead of us. Okay, so uh, with that, we have no other new motions. Are there any notices of motion? Okay, seeing none, Madam Deputy Clerk, ask for minutes, please. Moved by Deputy Mayor Boehm, seconded by Councillor Hassan, that the minutes of City Council Meeting Number 1-2023, held Tuesday, December 6, 2022, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. We have some tabling of documents, number of communications. Is there any other business? I'd like to wish all of you a wonderful time over the holidays to Council, to staff, to our community. Uh, and also to uh, make sure that everyone uh, is aware and invited to our New Year's levy 
2023. It will be right before our next council meeting on January the 10th from 5 to 7, and uh, it'll be a great chance to be able to connect with members of our community and be able to ring in the new year. So with that, uh, all the best to everyone, and I'll ask for a motion. Oh, I guess we should do bylaws first, right, Madam Deputy Clerk? Okay. <laughs> bylaws, please. Okay. Sorry to be a stick in the mud, uh, Mayor Patterson. Um, uh, Councillor Amos, you are excused for the first three bylaw votes uh, in relation to your declared conflict of interest. Okay. Moved by Councillor Chenani, seconded by Councillor Shaves, uh, that bylaws three and four be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, moved by Councillor Chenani, seconded by Councillor Shaves, that uh, Clause 12.63 of bylaw number 2021-41 be suspended for the purpose of giving bylaws three and four three readings. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Chinani, seconded by Councillor Shaves, that bylaws three and four be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And Councillor Amos, you can return. Okay, seconded by Councillor, uh, moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that bylaws 1, 2, 5, 6, and 8 through 27 be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that clause 12.63 of bylaw number 2021 41 be suspended for the purpose of giving bylaws <clears throat> 1 and 2, 3 readings. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And our final bylaw vote moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that bylaws 1, 5, and 6 through 8 and 27 be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Chenani, seconded by Councillor Amos. All those in favor? Opposed? And we are adjourned. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>